All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our virtual event space. So before we get started, Third Place Books would like to acknowledge that we are on the unceded ancestral land of the first people of Seattle, the Duwamish people, past and present, and honor with gratitude the Duwamish people and the land itself. So welcome everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in. My name is Allie. You might recognize me from our uh, Lake Forest Park location. Uh, I'm your host for this evening and I am so excited to be introducing Alejandro Perez Cortez, Claudia Castro Luna, and Gerald Bigelow here to discuss Alejandro's book, Ima and Coley are uh, are the tree that was never a seed. Uh, but before we get into the good stuff, on behalf of all of us here at Third Place Books, thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, for those of you who may not know, we are an independent bookstore with three locations in the Seattle area. And as much as we miss having these events in our bookstores, it has been such a delight to expand this online program to connect readers and authors in a virtual space. So thank you all so much for tuning in. And of course, for buying books, your support is what makes all of this possible. So if you haven't gotten your hands on copies of any of the books that come up this evening and you would like to, I will be linking to those books in our chat. For those of you in the Seattle area, come on in. All three of our locations are open. Um, or you can order online and come pick them up in the store. Or if you're not local, we of course ship. Um, so go ahead and follow those links in chat over to our website. While you're on our website, I definitely encourage you to check out some of our other upcoming events. Um, we're looking a little sparse over the holiday season, but that will be all, we'll be starting up again with lots of people and new authors and events in the coming year, in the new year. Um, so if you would like to stay in touch with our community, you can sign up for our newsletter. It's a weekly update about events and exciting releases, our online book clubs, and of course you can follow us on any of the major social media platforms. We are at Third Place Books for the quickest updates and recommendations. So we are here for about an hour and towards the end we will be taking questions. So if you have any questions, which we very much hope that you do, go ahead and leave those in the Q&A box, which should be either at the top or bottom of your screen. It is different than the chat box, which is great for virtual applause and connecting with each other. I absolutely invite you to share where you're tuning in from in the chat. Uh, but when it comes time for questions, do make sure that those end up in the Q&A so we can most easily find them. Uh, while you're in our chat and question spaces, I do want to remind you to please lead with kindness and refrain from any inappropriate behavior or harassment. For anyone interested, there are auto-generated closed captions available from the menu at the top or bottom of your screen. Select the live transcript button to enable or disable them. And finally, should any technical issues arise, we will work as quickly as we can to resolve them. Uh, and we appreciate so much your patience and understanding. All right, so it is time for us to settle in because without further ado, I am so thrilled to welcome Alejandro Perez Cortez, a poet and teacher here in Washington State. Uh, his poems and short stories have been published in various Mexican newspapers and his first English poems appeared in the anthology Soundings from the Salish Sea, a Pacific Northwest poetry anthology. His collection, Ima and Coley are the tree that was never a seed, won the Paz Peace, uh, Prize for Poetry, which was granted by the National Poetry Series, and is his impressionistic homage to his hometown, Colima, Mexico. Um, our next poet is a third place books friend, Claudia Castroluna, an Academy of American Poets Poet Laureate Fellow, Washington State Poet Laureate from 2018 to this year, and Seattle's inaugural civic poet from 2015 to 2018. Her books include One River, A Thousand Voices, Killing Marias, which was nominated for a push cart and shortlisted for the Washington State 2018 Book Award in Poetry, the chapbook This City, and the forthcoming Sipota Under the Moon, which scores a series of poems as an ode to the Salvadoran immigrant experience in the United States. And then our final speaker this evening is Gerald Vigilow. He's a retired aerospace 
aerospace IT executive and the editor and contributor to a recently published poetry anthology, Soundings from the Salish Sea, a Pacific Northwest poetry anthology, which may sound familiar. Uh, his poetry has appeared in the Arizona Centennial Anthology and in four editions of Between the Lines. He is an at-large board member for Epic Group Writers and chairs a monthly poetry group. So thank you all so much for being here. I am so excited to listen in on this conversation. If anyone needs anything, give me a shout. I will be listening and that's same goes for all of you in the audience. I love seeing you all chatting away in there. Um, and with that, I'm going to pass the stage to our authors. So welcome, both all three of you. Thank you, everyone. Um, thank you for being here. Um, I want to thank uh, Claudia and Jerry uh, for all your help, all your support. I will speak some Spanish for my Spanish speakers. I see you, I see you guys in the chat. Los veo, los veo en el chat. So I'm gonna be switching from Spanish to English from time to time. We also have Claudia who speaks uh, beautiful, fantastic Spanish and Jerry will help us with uh, uh, some of our English poems reading as well. And uh, well, I guess uh, I'm gonna start talking about uh, a little bit about El libro, Ima and Coli are the three that was never a seed. Um, first thing I should say, it's, uh, it took me um, 25 to 30 years to write this book. Um, I began to write this book in Colima, which is my home state. Uh, in the year 2000, 2001, then I, I moved to Washington in 2002. Um, I was gonna publish some of these poems in Colima, but as I said, I moved to Washington to teach Spanish. So my project stopped there. Um, I began writing a little bit, sending some poems from time to time to Colima. They were published in Spanish. So, if I have to find the three ages or three stages of my book, I would say uh, some poems were published in Spanish. Some poems were never published. They're, they're brand new. I wrote them on my notebook and then they were typed. And some poems were published in English um, um, in the anthology that was already mentioned, Soundings from the Salish Sea. Um, my book, it's my own genesis um, about Colima, my home state. Um, it begins with uh, a little bit of archaeological, pre-Hispanic Colima, which uh, started one day when, when I was walking with my father. Uh, uh, we were walking through mountains and, and cerros, how we call it in Colima, Los Cerros, which are little, little mountains. And my father himself, um, he made himself an archaeologist. He, he didn't go to college, he didn't go to the university. Um, he barely knew how to read and write, but, but he learned to read the earth, or he learned to read the ground when the mountains opened. And, and I remember him, um, we both were walking um, through the cerros, going down, going up. And suddenly he just looked at some spot, some very specific point uh, on the ground, and he would pick archeological pieces, just like that. Uh, I didn't know how he did it, but he just knew where to find them. And, that is how, how my uh, first poems start, uh, Con las tablas de piedra, which are uh, chronicle descriptions of an old ancient Colima that uh, never existed, that only existed in my imagination. And that is how um, my book started. 
and I think it's uh, convenient at this point that I read the first poem. Um, en este momento, para uh, mis amigos que hablan español, voy a leer el, el primer poema. I'm going to read the first poem, um, which also is the name of the book, Un Árbol Que Nunca Fue Semilla. I'm going to be reading in Spanish, and um, our friend Jerry uh, is going to read the English version. Un árbol que nunca fue semilla. En las ruinas de esta ciudad calcinada encontramos tablillas y relieves en piedra caliza. Destaca el relieve de un hombre que se escena la piedra hasta ser la metáfora junto con una mujer que exprime verbos hasta lograr que de sus conjugaciones brote un manantial de barro. En un anexo de estas tablillas se muestra el manantial de barro separarse. Esta separación del manantial de barro crea un lago y un valle de tierra agrietada. Es como tierra que se parte porque cruje, un valle que cruje. Hemos querido entender y explicar qué es más importante. El hombre que cercena la piedra hasta ser la metáfora o la mujer que exprime verbos. ¿Por qué aún se nos hiela la sangre cuando tratamos de explicar esto? Estamos ante algo que no es de este mundo. Hemos decidido ni explicar ni entender. ¿Es profética la metáfora cercenada de la piedra? ¿Sí o no? ¿Es el manantial de barro que brota de los verbos nuestro génesis? ¿Sí o no? A estas alturas no importa. Si algo importa es que no sabemos hoy. Y mejor aún que no supimos lo que pasará mañana. Existe la no respuesta a aquello de que fuimos formados del recuerdo del suelo. ¿Del recuerdo del suelo fuimos formados? ¿Cómo? No supimos cómo. Pero en esta tierra hemos descubierto que el recuerdo nos devora hasta darnos vida. Y empezar a vivir es la mejor manera de no convertirnos en memoria. Estas son las nueve tablillas de piedra caliza. Los relieves que narran los principios de la tierra de Ima y la tierra de Coli y del árbol que nunca fue semilla. Jerry. You, you might. The mic. To Mike. Let's try this. I apologize. Okay. A tree that was never a seed. <laughs> in the ruins of the charred city, we find tablets and reliefs carved in limestone. Most notably, among them is a relief of a man who chipped away the stone until making it a metaphor, and a woman who squeezed verbs using uh, until causing clay, clay to spring from their conjugations. In an appendix to these tablets, the clay spring is shown breaking free. This separation by the clay spring produced a lake and a valley made of fractured land. Like land that breaks apart before it crunches, a valley that crunches. We have tried to understand and explain which is more important. The man who chips away the stone until making it a metaphor or the woman who squeezes verbs. Why is our blood still curdled when we attempt to explain this? Are we dealing with something not from this world? We have decided to neither explain nor understand. Is the metaphor chipped from the stone a prophecy? Yes or no? Is the clay spring flowing from the verb of gen our genesis? Yes or no? At this point, it matters very little. If anything matters, it is that today we don't know. And it is better that we never found out what will come tomorrow. This is a non-answer to whether or not we were formed from the memory of the ground.
We were formed from the memory of the ground. How? We never found out how. But we discovered that in this land, memory devours us until giving us life. And starting to live is the best way for us not to become a memory. There are the nine limestone tablets, the relief that narrates the dawn of the land of Erma and the land of Koli, and the tree that never was a seed. Thank you, Jerry. Um, I'm moving to read the next poem, which in Spanish is called La Noche de Mañana. In English, it's called Tomorrow Night. And I dedicated this poem um, to, uh, to my writing group, which is um, uh, where I met Jerry. Um, we have a meeting every Tuesday. Uh, the, I'm sorry, the second Tuesday of the month. And I'm going to read the Spanish version. And uh, Claudia will read the English version after me. La noche de mañana. Para el taller literario Epic Group Writers in Edmonds, Washington. En el suelo hay un hombre, sangra, nos parecemos, se parece a mí. La noche de mañana no tiene nada que ver con el futuro. Sentado con su sangre, callado en el suelo, me parezco a él, al hombre sentado. Y hay también el policía y el lápiz del policía. ¿Escribe o miente? Si ese lápiz no escribe, ¿qué hace? Hay un hombre y hay también lo de mañana. Lo de mañana no es el futuro, es otro día, ese día. Llegará seguramente el día, pero no será el futuro. El día de mañana yo hice un mapa. Miento, no hice un mapa. A veces miento. Cuando el café no está hirviendo, miento. El café no estaba conmigo, pero el mapa sí. Porque el mapa era la tierra y la tierra era yo. Estaba allí cuando llegué y el hombre ya sangraba y el mapa, los límites, las fronteras nos cruzaron a nosotros. Al mapa ni lo toqué, al mapa lo que le hice fue extenderle los límites con una palabra recién inventada. Espertancia, que significa esperanza en la distancia. El policía miraba su lápiz y la sangre del hombre miraba el lápiz. Si ese lápiz no escribe, ¿qué hace? ¿Qué hace un lápiz cuando un hombre que se parece a mí sangra en el suelo? El hombre no entiende al policía, pero el frío se entiende con el hombre. El policía que escribe y el hombre que sangra no se entienden. Lo sé porque puedo verlo. Lo sé porque me di cuenta sin aprenderlo. Lo supe sin que nadie me enseñara. El policía no entiende al hombre. Lo sé porque no nací aquí. Nací ayer o mañana, no importa cuándo, porque mañana lo que viene, eso, eso no es el futuro. Mi color es moreno, como el hombre que sangra en el suelo. No tanto como él, pero su sangre cayendo al suelo es como la mía. Desde mi carro, la sangre, sus rodillas, el café, el policía, el frío. Desde mi carro, la espertancia, esperanza en la distancia. Pero yo a veces soy mi carro, mi carro soy este que bebe café mientras observo al hombre que sangra. Mi carro soy este que bebo sin frío. Y ocurre que desde aquí se ve lo de mañana. Lo de mañana es cualquier cosa, pero nunca será otro día. El futuro que se ve venir no es mañana. Es otro día, pero no es nuevo. Eso de mañana, los próximos minutos no son el futuro. Será quizá por eso que ahora son tres los lápices, tres armas, tres policías. Hay tres lados en la historia, quisiera decir cuatro. Cuatro lados en la historia. Pero un lado de la historia no cuenta. El hombre que sangra no cuenta porque no lo entienden. Pero yo que veo esto, a veces me he sentado a pedir un café. Hace días me preguntaron, ¿dónde aprendió a hablar español? ¿Dónde aprendí español? Y yo pensé en mi madre. Lo aprendí en mi madre. Ella no nació aquí, pero morirá aquí. Mañana tenemos una cita. La cita es el primer pago para la cremación de mi madre. Yo le traduzco a mi madre. 
Mi madre no quiso el paquete funerario que incluye liberar diez palomas blancas mientras la creman. Diez palomas. Oigo pensar a mi madre llena de tristeza. Pobrecitas palomas. En Seattle llueve tan frío. ¿Podrán encontrar cobijo cuando las liberen mientras me creman? ¿Dónde aprendí español? Me preguntaron y no supe qué decir. Igual que el hombre que sangra en el suelo no sabe qué decir. Moreno, el hombre como yo. Ante los tres lápices me obliga a pensar en el mapa y en espertancia, esperanza en la distancia. Y es por la sangre del hombre que pienso en lo que ya dije, que yo no hago mapas, yo borro los límites y extiendo las fronteras, porque las fronteras no nos cruzaron a nosotros. Es lo que ya dije, lo mismo, pero cambio las palabras. Yo digo que dije, que mañana, eso que viene, lo que esperamos que ocurra, eso, el día tal, eso no es el futuro, no, es la noche de mañana, y ya, la expertancia. Gracias, Alejandro. Uh, por tu bello poema y tu bello libro. Thank you so much for such a beautiful, stunning book. I, um, I, this is my copy, and I, if you have not read it, uh, some of you I imagine already have read it, but if you have not, I encourage you to go and get yourself a copy. This is um, the best reading I've done this year. It's really fantastic, and it's no wonder that you want that uh, the competition and I, I from the preface I could see that there were many entries and you certainly deserve it. This is a fantastic book. Um, and it is my pleasure to, to read the English version of the poem you just read. Um, tomorrow night for the Epic Group Writers Workshop in Edmonds, Washington. There is a man on the ground, bleeding. We look alike. He looks like me. Tomorrow night is not about the future. Sitting there with his blood silent on the ground, I look like him, like the man sitting. And the policeman is there also, and the policeman's pencil. Does it write or does it lie? If that pencil doesn't write, then what does it do? There is a man and there's also tomorrow. Tomorrow is not the future. It's another day, that day. The day will surely come, but it won't be the future. Tomorrow during the day, I drew a map. I'm lying. I didn't draw a map. Sometimes I lie. When the coffee isn't boiling, I lie. The coffee wasn't with me, but the map was, because the map was the land, and the land was me. It was there that I arrived, and the man was buried, already bleeding. And the map, the boundaries, the borders crossed us. I didn't even touch the map. What I did was extend its boundaries with a word I just came up with, hopenstance, which means hope in the distance. And the policeman was looking at his pencil and the man's blood was looking at the pencil. If that pencil doesn't write, then what does it do? What does a pencil do when a man who looks like me is bleeding on the ground? The man doesn't understand the policeman, but the cold understands the man. The policeman writing and the man bleeding don't understand each other. I know because I can see it. I know because I realized it without learning about it. I knew it without anyone teaching me about it. The policeman doesn't understand the man. I know because I wasn't born here. I was born yesterday or tomorrow. It doesn't matter when, because tomorrow what's coming, that, that is not the future. My color is brown, like the man on the ground bleeding, not as much as his, but his blood falling to the ground is like mine. From my car, the blood, his knees, the coffee, the policeman, the cold from my car, hop in stance, hope in the distance. But sometimes I am my car. I am my car, the one drinking coffee while I watch the man who is bleeding. I am my car, the one drinking who feels no cold. And it happens that from here you can see tomorrow. Tomorrow is anything, but it'll never be another day. The future you see coming isn't tomorrow. It is another day, but it's not new. Tomorrow, the next few minutes 
are not the future. Maybe that is why there are now three pencils, three guns, three policemen. There are three sides to the story. I meant to say four, four sides to the story. But one side of story doesn't count. The man bleeding doesn't count because they don't understand him. But seeing this, sometimes I have sat down to order coffee. A few days ago, they asked me, what did, when, where did you learn to speak Spanish? Where did I learn Spanish? And I thought about my mother. I learned it inside my mother. She wasn't born here, but she will die here. Tomorrow we have an appointment. The appointment is to make the first payment on my mother's cremation. I translate for my mother. My mother didn't want the funeral package that comes with 10 white doves released as they cremate her. 10 doves, I hear my mother thinking, filled with sadness. Poor little doves. In Seattle, the rain is so cold. Would they be able to find shelter once they release them while they cremate me? Where did I learn Spanish, they asked me, and I didn't know what to say. Just like the man bleeding on the ground doesn't know what to say. Brown, the man like me, seeing those three pencils forces me to think about the map and about hope in stance, hope in the distance. And it's because of the man's blood that I think about what I have already said, that I don't make maps. I erase the boundaries and extend the borders because the borders crossed us. It's what I've already said, the same thing, but I change up the words. I say that I said that tomorrow, what's coming, what we hope happens, that, that day, that is not the future. No, it's tomorrow night, nothing more. Hope in stands. Gracias, Claudia. Thank you, Claudia, for that beautiful reading. Um, so I'm moving to our third poem. Um, En español, el nombre del poema es Balance de mi cuenta de cheques. Uh, in English, it's My Checking Account Balance. Um, I included this poem in, um, in the anthology Soundings from the Salish Sea. Um, for this, um, for Ima and Koli, I, I rewrote the poem. I made some changes. Um, this is the last version, uh, Balance de mi cuenta de cheques. Soy un hombre de palabra, no más poesía, dije. Esto que lees no es un poema, es un balance de mi cuenta de cheques. Soy una plaga de autos dirigiéndose al centro comercial. Las ofertas empiezan a medianoche. Pobre de mí que tengo dinero, pero no tiempo para gastarlo. Acecho afuera de las tiendas y pienso en los días que Roma sitió Jerusalén. Padre, cada dólar que gano me aleja más de casa. Un dólar es igual a dos millas más lejos del barco pirata donde nací que espera mi regreso para hundirse. Dos dólares es igual a cuatro millas más lejos del sauce llorón que me enseñó lo bello que es un hombre cuando llora por la mujer que extraña. Tres dólares es igual a ocho millas más lejos de la cometa roja de mi infancia rota que aún me espera para arreglarla. Cuatro dólares es igual a 16 millas más lejos de los cuervos que encargué para que cuidaran de mis hortalizas. Cinco dólares es igual a 32 millas más lejos de la bala con que te pegaste un tiro. Ay, padre, si estuvieras aquí y me oyeras decir que soy amigo de la bala con que te pegaste un tiro, seguramente te dispararías otra vez. Y qué dilema, padre, qué dilema. Si te disparas otra vez, ¿qué hago? Recojo los trozos de tu cráneo destrozado o aprieto los dólares despiadadamente por temor a que el viento los arranque de mis manos. Qué miserable potastro es tu hijo, padre. Tengo que hacer publicidad de tu muerte para ver si publico algo. Estoy infectado, estoy infestado, estoy defecado. Ruego que mañana me lleve un tren a cualquier parte. Gracias. Y ahora, I'm going to invite Jerry. Please read the English version. My checking account balance. I am a man of my word. No more poetry, I said. What you are reading now isn't, po isn't a poem. It's my checking account balance. I am a plague of cards heading to the mall. The sale starts at midnight. Oh, woe is me. I have money, but no time to spend it. I lie and wait outside the store and think about the days when Rome laid siege to Jerusalem. 
Father, every dollar I earn takes me further away from home. One dollar equals two miles further from the pirate ship where I was born that awaits my return so it can sink. Two dollars equals four miles further from the weeping willow that showed me how beautiful a man is when he cries over the woman he misses. Three dollars equals eight miles further and the red kite from my broken childhood that is still waiting for me to fix it. Four dollars equals 16 miles further from the ravens I left in charge of watching over my vegetable garden. Five dollars equals 32 miles further from the bullet that you killed yourself with. Oh father, if you were here and heard me saying that the bullet you killed yourself with is my friend, you surely shoot yourself again. And what a dilemma, Father, what a dilemma. If you shoot yourself again, what will I do? Gather the fragments of your, excuse me, of your shattered skull or ruthlessly clutch my dollars for fear that the wind might come and snatch them from my hands. What an awful portress your son is. Father, I have to advise, I have to advertise your death in an attempt to get something published. I'm infected, I'm infested, I'm defecated. I pray that tomorrow the train takes me somewhere, anywhere. Thank you, Jerry. Gracias, Jerry. Um, uh, now we're moving to um, the next poem. Um, the name of the poem is in Spanish, Lloro como niña que rasgó su vestido favorito. In English, I'm crying like a girl who's torn her favorite dress. I wrote these poems um, to my mom. The name of this section in the book uh, is called um, Letter to Make, um, A Letter to Make My Mom Smile. And this is a poem in Spanish. Lloro como niña que rasgó su vestido favorito. Si yo fuera fuerte como esa neblina tormenta que cuelga de las cataratas de tus ojos, conseguiría varios metros de cielo y unos, hijos, y unos hilos de verano para hacerte un vestido colibrí, madre. Pero no, nunca me gusta lo que escribo. Si ni siquiera soy bueno para escribirte un poema, ¿de dónde se me ocurre que voy a tejerte un vestido? Por eso lloro. Lloro como niña que rasgó su vestido favorito de olanes y moñitos. Lloro como un fiero pirata que ve hundirse envuelto en llamas el barco donde nació. I'm going to invite Claudia to please read the English version. Of the poem. I'm crying like a girl who's torn her favorite dress. If I were strong, like that mist storm that pours from the cataracts in your eyes, I would gather a few meters of sky and some summer threads to make you a hummingbird dress, mother. But no, I never like what I write. I'm not even good at writing you a poem. Where did I get the idea that I'm going to sew you a dress? That's why I'm crying. I'm crying like a girl who's torn her favorite dress with ruffles and ribbons, or I'm crying like a cutthroat pirate looking on as the ship he was born on is engulfed by flames sinking. Gracias, Claudia. Thank you very much for your beautiful reading. And um, we now move to the final poem um, for tonight. And the name of this poem in Spanish, it's uh, Cuando me fui, llevé conmigo. In English, when I left, I took with me. And this poem, it's about when I left Colima. Um, when I talked to people in Colima, I said, I, I left Colima, but Colima never left me. Um, so this poem has some um, Nahuatl words mm -hmm. uh, that were, uh, I guess, complicated to translate into English. Um, they're at the end of the poem, and this is the Spanish version. Um, so, so Jerry, if you don't know how to pronounce the Nahuatl words, don't worry. <laughs> my, my son helped me. It's okay. Cuando me fui, llevé conmigo este lápiz escribiendo mi mano, el murmullo de las hormigas que devoran las entrañas de la tierra y la noche. Es necesario ver llegar la noche 
aquel septiembre, la tarde amarilla, algo de lluvia por las calles, un aroma de chocolate calientito saliendo de las casas. No estás, Colima, y para soportar requiero, preciso recordarte, observar cómo muere sedienta de oscuridad la noche que en mí nació cuando de ti me fui. Me fui, pero recordaba. Es cierto lo que dice la tablilla de arcilla. Recordar da vida. Recordar me ayudó a soñar en ti. Y dormí tranquilo y desperté un día, como si durante la oscuridad no olvidarte me hubiera curado de lepra. O mejor, Colima, como si tu voz que ya no tengo me hubiese dicho, levántate y anda. Y yo regresara a ti siendo otro, como si conociera ahora los secretos de la tumba y conjuntar a las muchedumbres para decirles, heme aquí que les develaré no al mensaje de Lázaro, sino al mensaje del árbol de Parota. Yo soy la resurrección de las ramas de Parota. Esperaré, vendré, seré Colima, soportaré, me bastará que alguien diga volcán, flor amarilla de primavera, palmera, bugambilia, serpiente, sanate, tejuino, perros o los quincle. Y al instante pensaré en ti. Okay. When, I, when I left, I took with me this pencil, my handwriting, the murmur of the ants devouring the entrails of the earth and the night. Seeing the night arrive is essential. That September, the amber afternoon, a few drops of rain in the street, the smell of hot chocolate coming from houses. You're not here, Colima, and to endure, I need, I must remember you. Notice how the night dies thirsting for darkness, the night that rose inside me when I left you. I left, but I remember, it is true. What the clay tablet says, remembering gives life. Remembering helps me to dream about you. And I sleep in peace. And one day awoke as if during the darkness, not forgetting you had cured my leprosy. Or better yet, Kolima, is your voice that is no longer mine has said, said unto me, rise and walk. And I return to you, someone else. And if I know, and if, and, and excuse me, and if I now knew the secret of the grave and the summoning the masses to say unto them, here I am, I will, I will reveal to you the message, not the message of Lazarus, but the message of the parota tree. I am the resurrection of the parota branches. I will wait. I will come. I will be Colima. I will endure. I only need for someone to say volcano, yellow spring flower, tree bo uh, palm tree, bougainvillea, snake crackle, trajino, and show esta quindly, dog. Instantly, I will think of you. Thank you, Jerry. I tried the know what, the best I could. <laughs> It's a complicated word, even for Spanish speakers. So. Yes, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Well, um, this concludes our reading, the poems, and I guess now we, we have a time to talk, um, Claudia and Jerry. Yeah, I, I'm wondering, Alejandro, if, because um, I'm looking at the time, I wonder if you want to open up for questions from the audience. Um, You know, uh, I mean, I, I don't know if there are audience questions, but. Um, sure, if, if someone has a question, the audience, I will, I will do my best to try to answer both in Spanish and English. Uh, see how Hi, <laughs> so I think that's a great idea. How about audience members, if you have any questions, now is a great time to start throwing them in the Q&A. Oh, I see a couple already. Um, so I will ask these these questions that we have let's you know if if things are looking a little if people are shy um i'll pass the question asking to claudia and gerald is that okay yeah wonderful so here's the first question i have from chat is um from sean uh, it says i loved how the emotional impact felt so similar between la noche de mañana and tomorrow night. Can someone speak more about the translation process and how the translator managed maintaining this emotional tether so well? Mm -hmm. 
Well, I, I will. I will start. Uh, um, we worked the translation. Uh, it took about um, three, four months, probably a little bit more. Um, Sean, the translator, and me, uh, we used to Zoom, sometimes over the phone, and we would spend hours um, analyzing just one word, one sentence, the order of the sentence. Um, I was and I am very satisfied with the translation. Um, uh, I read the poems in English. I gave the poems to, to my friends, to my family who speak English as a first language. And uh, um, I asked them to please read it and, and tell me what is, what do you feel when you read the poem? What is the message that, that it sends to you, the, the ideas? Um, and they were happy and I was happy. And um, I think, I think we, we together, um, Sean and I, we, we, we did a, a very good translation in English, trying to keep the main, main message, yeah. Mm -hmm. I know this is a, this was a question for Alejandro, but I have to chime in because I um, obviously am able to read the Spanish poems, and I have, and I've read the the poems in English as well, and it, it's an excellent translation. And I think it uh, I think that care and that collaboration between you, Alejandro, and your translator really shines through because it is really well done. And now you're talking about it, I could see why because it really shows that you were talking to each other. And so the nuances um, and the texture of the poems in Spanish are, are, is there um, in, in the English versions. Yeah, it's a Thank wonderful you. translation. So from here, I'm going to uh, ask the audience one more time, if you have questions, go ahead and just throw them in the q and I will be keeping an eye on those. Um, until we have more questions from you, I'm going to pass the question asking responsibilities to Claudia and Gerald. I, I will, we, I, Jerry and I both have lots of questions, um, <laughs> but I am burning to ask this question uh, of you, Alejandro, the, in the book, you come up with these words, right? This, 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 um, these constructions that don't exist in Spanish, uh, espertancia, quem, quemranza, um, so hope and stands, hope, hope burn, it's just so, I just love the way you, you came up with those terms. Uh, it's very German. It's, that is in fact how German words, nouns are created by slinging nouns together. And that's why Germans have such long words, right? Because they just <laughs> pile up the nouns. Um, so I, um, I'm just, I would love to hear you speak about how you came up with, with this uh, new terms, you know? So wonderful. Thank you. Um, certainly, uh, I have to say, um, those are my influences. Um, some of you may be familiar with uh, Cesar Vallejo, Peru, and mm -hmm. Trilce, which is exactly one of those words, Trilce, triste y dulce, which means sad and sweet. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the poet who has influenced me more on that is uh, Vicente Huidobro. Chileno Vicente Huidobro, um, Altazor, which means alto y azul, or blue and, and tall. Um, I guess that's the way how I'm um, giving them recognition for their beautiful poetry. So I am not doing anything new. I cannot take credit saying that I'm doing something new in, in, in poetry because it has been there for, for some time. So the only thing I did is continue in the tradition of um, creating new words, new silogismos, how they are called in, in Spanish. Yeah, the, the hope burn, the um, quemranza or hope burn is so fabulous because it has multiple um, meanings, you know, hope that burns, that's such a hope that burns your spirit, right? That you long for something, but also 
something that just burns you that you're 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 exhausted by right there's these multiple meanings inside these words it's just really wonderful yeah it's one of the many surprises in the book coming across these words oh mm -hmm. okay so you my friend i have a question for you if you don't mind oh go ahead jerry please We've known each other for quite a while i have uh, affectionately and respectfully start calling you the uh, Salvador Dali of poetry. Ah. <laughs> so, yeah, because I really, I sincerely wonder, and, 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 and in a very interesting way, how you've come up with some of these just wonderful imagination, creative and, you know, imagination that you have. And could you talk about that a little bit? What has it influenced your imagination and how you see the world and, and how you write? Well, I, I like to play with conjugations. And um, um, I've been writing a series of poetry and, and short stories and um, where I just play with time tenses and conjugation, mm -hmm. where I, I use future conjugations um, and I link them or put them together with uh, things from the past. So mm -hmm. I, I create this, this mixing where time either does not exist or, or it bends or extends and comes back. And so I, I just break time tenses and conjugations. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, what, that's what I do. I, I, I hope that answers your, your question. Well, well, the bottom line is it's a, it's a spectacular way of doing things and I really appreciate it. And it's, <laughs> it's unique, but it's wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. and it, it renders your book, it gives your book a, uh, um, a spatialness, there, there isn't any, part, it, it speaks of space, it speaks of particular places, but they're everywhere. So they're here and nowhere at the same time. And when you're inside the book, um, you are suspended. You're really suspended in, a, in this world of its own that has no boundaries, really. You can't, you can't, and even in the poem I read, speaking of the future and the present, and there's no tomorrow, but there will be a tomorrow, but that's not the future, you know? And it, it makes you really, there's a lot of considerations of time inside the book, for sure. What, how do we understand time and what time is, right? And, and you're coming at it from not, not, a, not a physics, but, but a poetics that is just really wonderful. And, and, it, and it suspends you. You are inside a territory as you traverse this, this book. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for writing this amazing book. <laughs> thank you for all you help. So, so the Q and A has exploded. Thanks, audience members. <laughs> uh, but a pressing question that I'm getting from lots of people is, what poets have influenced your poetry and your love of poetry? Um, Laura asks, when did you know you were a poet? Ah. Uh. Well, some of the poems who have influenced me, it's, uh, I mentioned two of them, Vicente Huidobro from, from Chile, uh, Cesar Vallejo, um, Jaime Sabines uh, from Mexico, uh, Jose Hierro. Uh, but I also, I also read uh, Juan Rulfo, I like a lot, Juan Rulfo, um, Alejandra Pizarnik, uh, mm -hmm. it's one of my favorite poems poets that I've been reading over and over and then I read her once and then I go back and read again and every time I read her it's like I discover something new something that I missed the first time I I read her mm -hmm. so those those are just one one poets um to mention now uh when did I when did I realize I I was a poet I, I, I don't think I'm a poet yet. Uh, someday uh, I will be a poet. I, right now I consider myself someone who is still learning to write poetry. Uh, it's a very personal view, but um, my first poems go all the way back from high school. High school, um, when, I, when I began to write and um, I was like 19 years old when I first published my first poem um, in Colima. And I guess that's how everything started. Uh, yeah. 
So let's see here. Um, I have a question here in chat that says, um, what advice do you have for burgeoning young or old writers? Well, I believe that reading, reading it's the most important thing. If, um, if you don't read, you cannot write. Um, I encourage reading rather than, than writing. Um, actually, I think I'm, I'm, I'm more than a reader than, than a writer. Uh, because reading is what feeds you, it's what gives you ideas, it's what uh, makes you create, yeah, reading. Then, then we'll see what happens after reading. So I have a question here that says, I love the titles of your poems. Uh, do you write them first, last, or sometimes in, or sometime in the middle of a poem? Well, my purpose was to create a story using the names of the poems. Uh, so I, I placed the names and the titles of each poem so they could tell a story. When, when, when the reader opened the book and, and they looked through the index, I wanted the titles, every name, all together, um, give a story, present a story. So uh, names change it many times. Uh, when I realized that the specific name of a poem um, was not in the story with the spirit of the section, I just change it. Um, that's how I did it. Um, do you ever, this is from Ellen, do you have, do you ever write poems in both Spanish and English at the same time? Uh, sometimes, sometimes I, uh, there are a few sections, a few poems um, that I, I wrote them completely in English. Um, few sections, small sections, because I'm only writing in Spanish. It's, it's, it's my, my first language. So most of it is written in Spanish. But yes, I have, I have, I have experience and tried um, writing in English. Yeah. So I'm looking at the time and we're about at the end of our evening. So I'm going to let um, let our, our guests ask two more questions, one each, hopefully. Um, Claudia, do you have a good question to head us towards the end of the evening with? Well, my, my, my other big question was uh, in reading your, your work was, I wanted to know who you read. That was my other question, which you have answered, because I also believe that in order to write, you need to read. The two things are inseparable. And so I was, I was curious as I read through the manuscript, you know, just who, 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 who do you turn to? And, and I have written down the names you, you know, the, the, the poets that you mentioned. So some of them, of course, I recognize. Um, some of them are new, but I believe me, I will be seeking these writers myself <laughs> just to read because they sound marvelous. And, and I'm just so pleased with, uh, you work and, and I want it to be out in the world and for people to read it um, because it's just fantastic. Thank you. But th thank you for inviting me tonight, Alejandro. Thank you. So I have one, one last question, if you don't mind. So uh, how did you actually in the beginning become affiliated with the Epics uh, Poetry Group there in Edmonds? How did that happen? Uh, I was looking for a group of writers. I was... Um, I quit writing for about, I don't know, nine, 10 years of my life. Um, and one night I just realized I couldn't quit forever. And I began to look for uh, people, writers. I went online. I found the Epic Writers Group. Uh, the second Tuesday, every month I show up. Yeah, that's how I met you. That's how I met everybody. and. Uh, I think, I'm glad I made that decision. Um, well, that goes for taking me. I, we're, I, glad, I, we're glad you made the decision also, trust uh, me. <laughs> thank you. So, it's a pleasure. I want to thank you myself from the bottom of my heart for allowing me to participate. And Claudia, my friend, it's always a pleasure to see you. Yeah, All likewise. yeah likewise, Jerry. So our closing question, this is from Sean, but it's from me as well. Um, 
and this is for everybody. What are you working on next? If you can talk about it. <laughs> Claudia? Oh, me. I, I think that's for you. No. <laughs> yeah, well, I've, I've been writing. I've, uh, I've been trying to write or finish um, my first long, short story or first short novel. I'm, I'm still putting it together. Um, but it's there. It's there. We'll see what happens. I look forward to reading it. <laughs> exactly. Well, I have to say I'm working on a new book of poems. Well, I have a new book coming out in April, uh, and I'm really excited about it, um, Tipota Under the Moon. And I'm working on a memoir that I have been working on for a long, long time. And it's like you, <laughs> it's there. I plow, you know, I sit and I, and I chisel away. So hopefully maybe in 2022, um, I could finish it and get it out into the world. Yeah. Wonderful. And Jerry, how about you? Yeah, Jerry, one more. Well, I've got a book out. It's called Memories Looking Through a Screen Door. It's a book of poetry. And it's been out for a while. And one of my really, really good friends there in Edmonds is helping to, to move along the, uh, the uh, adver advertisements uh, about the book and stuff. I'm kind of not really good at that, but this person is wonderful at it. So I appreciate all the help I'm getting. And it's done fairly well, but uh, it uh, kind of chronicles when I was young to now that I'm old. You know, but it, it covers several things in it. It covers tell us, the, tell us the title again, Jerry. It, the title is called Memories Looking Through a Screen Door. Thank you. Well, thank you. All right. Well, I'm we have about reached the close of our time together. So I just want to say very quickly, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, this was such a beautiful reading and Q&A. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, for everyone who would like to get your hands on copies of Ema and Coley are the trees that was never a seed. I'm going to go ahead and post the link one more time. Mm -hmm. we've we've scrolled we've been chatting this whole night away so it's been great so there's the link go ahead and follow that oh, it's a beautiful cover um let us know audience members let us know what you thought of this event either in person or online we always always love to hear from you authors thank you so much for being here and sharing your work with us this has been an absolute pleasure uh is there any last thing you'd like to share before we say good night Thank you, everyone. Thank you for being here. All right. Well, I'm loving all of the outpouring of love that I'm seeing in this chat. Thank you all so for being here one more time. And with that, shall we let the awkward waving commence? <laughs> <laughs> Good night, everyone. Good night, everybody. <laughs> Thank you so much. Gracias. Gracias. Buenas noches. Buenas noches.